Is this podcast number seven or eight? Now who's counting? Yeah, I lost count. Doesn't say on the. Oh uh, yeah, it is podcast number. Congratulations. Um, Does it not? No. Oh, that's my bad. No, hey, you know we're podcast number something. Welcome back. My name is Daniel Katzman, financial advisor out of Newport Beach. That's Ian White, financial advisor out of Mission Viejo. And Mustafa El Shabini, the man, the myth, the legend, Orange County's favorite photographer with uh, Paradise Photography, OC. And uh, to start things off, Ian, uh, you know, Rosebud Thorne, how was your week, man? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, I've got a. Uh, well, it's a few new clients coming in, so that's a rose for sure. Uh, Bud, I can't talk about right now, but it's a good one. Good. Thorn is, I don't like wearing sunscreen, but I love being outside. Okay. <laughs> Sun is back. I hear you. I hear you. When I was a kid, I hated wearing sunscreen. It was like the worst thing on planet Earth. Because, you know, your parents are grabbing you, come here, let's put this on you, and you get sprayed. And you're like, ah. But I've been sunburned so many times to the point where it's yeah. just like absolute pain that I just I have fair skin. I have to wear sunscreen. <laughs> what about you, Rosebud Thorn? Uh, Rose is getting a lot of uh, great, great leads lately. A lot of referrals. So appreciative of everybody that's been referring me. Uh, but I would say, uh, I don't know. What's the bud again? Something that's coming up. That's good. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the end of the year and the holidays and the season already starting. Uh, um, the thorn will be how everything is, is getting started. We're just finishing up graduation, so I have a lot of <laughs> a lot of events that tend to. Yeah. And photo shoots and uh, that's about it. But there's a Fourth of July block fest coming up. That's a huge citywide event. There's hundreds of thousands of people that show up to that every year. It's super fun, fireworks, food trucks, the works. Um, come on down, say hi. I'll be there all day long, running around with a clipboard and driving a golf cart. So come on by. Um, to get into uh, today's subject, we're going to talk about you know school, graduating, joining the workforce, um, you know navigating the job search. Do you guys even remember that far back? <laughs> I was still in college when it happened. Yeah. Luckily. Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> thank God you didn't end up coming out and sitting around for a year trying to figure out what you wanted to do. Yeah, that was a very common experience. Is 2012. Uh, the recession was over at that point, but so many people had lost their jobs previous to that that you had very overqualified people, couldn't find jobs, so they were taking whatever they could which means most people coming out for like an entry level position, there was like a five or 10 year vet with that job. And yeah. how are you supposed to compete with that? You can't. So how did you compete? Uh, well, there was a program specifically for recent college grads uh, for Edward Jones. Gotcha. And the number one thing that got me that job was the volunteer experience uh, that I did in college. And it wasn't just here and there. It was every single weekend for almost the entire time I was in college. And it was specific uh, programs, you know, it's in the two different boards. Uh, and so it has to be something that you can actually put in your resume. You know, you're not just showing up to the food bank here and there. It's what can I actually do to improve my skills and gotcha. help people. What skills do you think it, being on those boards mostly helped you grow? Uh, I think it was uh, a lot of leadership skills uh, because most of the events that we were planning had a lot of people involved. Uh, I was doing uh, leadership, marketing, uh, it, discipline, showing up on Saturday mornings in college. Uh, and then, you know, the financial part of it, uh, not a whole lot involved on my part, but. You know, we, we did put together some pretty successful events that made a lot of money. And so just being a part of something like that uh, is in and of itself something that's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about you? 
Did you didn't have a necessarily traditional no, road to it's not to yeah it. for photographers it's not really the traditional route you kind of have to find your own path. Did you uh, end up going to college? I did go to university for uh, industrial design. Okay. Background in art, so <laughs> that's uh, part of the reason you become a photographer. Yeah. You know, but it was always a hobby for me, and I just you know kept putting the time in it, and uh, was photography is just building up your portfolio, showing people what you're capable of, and you know to keep working on it basically. So, Absolutely. And so you just basically realized I'd rather take pictures than go to class? Uh, no, I went to industrial design and finished all of that, but it just I didn't feel like that's what I'm passionate about more. You know, it was more of just trying to uh, just go to school because you're supposed to go to school. Yeah. But when I ended up finding something that I love, I'm passionate about, you know, I'm part of, part of people's memory, like best memories of life. So it's, uh, it's a lot more rewarding. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of follow your passion, work at it, you keep trying to get better and better, and uh, people start loving your work, and then it's a lot more rewarding than you can even imagine. So. 100%. Did you end up graduating? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So you got the degree. Did you end up like just kind of being like, I don't know what to do afterwards? Yeah. I mean, I went to school basically to work in designing cars. Okay. Uh, but I just didn't like the industry and how a lot of the junior designers are kind of overlooked and overworked and, uh, you know, they're uh, <laughs> a little bit <laughs> tough on them, so. It's, it's a lot of industries. Yeah, yeah, especially when you're starting, it's tough and everybody's just, you know, trying to get you into the rhythm of, uh, of working hard. But again, it's just, a lot of it, I believe, it's passion. If you choose to go to school for something that you're passionate about, you are going to put the work in and it's going to definitely show. So a lot of it is just, you know, picking something that you are super passionate about, that you care about. You know, whether it be in the financial industry, medical industry, you know, whichever industry you feel like you want to contribute to and try to, to contribute to a better society. Absolutely. Absolutely, I like that. So it was, uh, how long were you kind of in uh, no man's land after college before you ended up being like, I'm going to take this photography I want to say serious. three to four years. Three to four years? Yeah, but it was kind of, I was going through some medical issues too. And uh, a big part of it was just not realizing what, how I can see my life in the future. And uh, photography was kind of one of my, you know, hobbies that kind of put me out of thinking and just enjoying nature, taking pictures of animals, taking pictures of, you know, sunsets, stuff like that. And that helped me kind of find my way. A lot of people start noticing my pictures, telling me that, you know, I, uh, I should be a photographer. So it kind of took the, the leap and... Like, why not <laughs> try it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it paid off. It paid off a lot. For real? <laughs> For real? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I didn't listen to a lot of people that, like my parents, a lot of people that were like, don't, you know, what are you doing? You know, if you want to go back to school. But a lot of it is just following my passion, figuring out my way, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. How can I be a better photographer? You know, a lot of it is just working on yourself. You know, downtime for everybody is can be useless, or you can use it to learn stuff. To, you know, I would go out and shoot at night to learn about lighting and, you know, how you can get certain shots and how not to get the pictures grainy. And, you know, work on the settings. And you continue on working on things, and you get better and better. Absolutely. So. In today's society, it's a very loud world, and it's hard to listen to that passion. Yeah, especially with social media and everything, it's very difficult to, you know, kind of, you find everybody now on their phone, on, you know, Instagram, and just all these different TikToks, and, you know, people doing dances and stuff. No, focus on, you know, what you're passionate about, what you care about, the difference that you want to see in this world. You know, a lot of it just... It's working on what 
you really care about in this world and making it work for the society and making we all are good at one thing you know or what we're passionate about so if everybody in society actually works on that it'll be a much better society but too many distractions like you said mom always said f doing what you're good at or do f doing what you like do what you're good at and you'll love it anyways yeah so yeah i think it's funny we're we're in a society where it's silly to look like you're working hard and taking something seriously try to be doing nuts. this TikTok trend or whatever like yeah. that's what you're supposed to be doing yeah <laughs> it's been that way since middle school you're never allowed to look like you're trying hard right you're not supposed to look like this is school is hard nothing's difficult you're supposed to be like oh, I didn't try I didn't study I didn't do anything and it's like that's how you're cool yeah but I saw that all over the place but you know what there's always you know the popular groups who are into that and there's like that one guy or girl who's really popular but they don't really follow any of the rules and it's because they don't follow the rules they do what they want to do which is usually working hard and being nice to people and they're still popular it's like oh that's weird okay so you actually can focus on you and still be successful. Shout out Kaylin Martin. <laughs> uh, she knows who she is. It's a perfect example. One in every class. Um, yeah. No. And then you've got people who actually do care about you, but they're speaking out of fear, right? Mm -hmm. So like your family, they're worried for you. They want you to be able to succeed, which means make enough money to support a family, and so they want you to do the the thing that's it's not guaranteed, but they think it's safer. Yeah. But what they don't realize is when we take the safe option that's not a passion, uh, that can lead to burnout, that can lead to failed relationships, uh, failed careers, and, and then where are you? You know where. <clears throat> Tina Schutz Creek. <laughs> Beep that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, you gotta figure it out. Um, that's the problem, though, right? What I was trying to get at is it's a very loud world, and, you know, to find out what you're passionate about is, to a lot of people, they're like, I'm not passionate about anything, you know? At the end of their degree, they end up with a finance degree, and they're like, yeah, I don't care. And, and, yeah, and then you ask them, like, what they, what'd you try? What'd you learn about outside of this? I'm like, oh, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah, you wasted your time. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have all this potential as young people, uh, and that potential is sought after, uh, in the older generation, uh, even envied. But as you creep up to 30, it's like, okay, that's not really potential anymore. It's a wasted potential. Uh, and the longer you wait to do something, uh, the less likely it is that it's ever going to happen. Yeah. And so a lot of people just need to wake up and start playing in reality. Stop playing in the sandbox. <laughs> Stop protesting stuff that has no impact on their life. Everything's and on YouTube now. You can learn whatever you want. Yeah, and I'm a big believer in the YouTube University. Yes. There's a video on everything you need to learn. And uh, it's uh, like a lot of the photography stuff that I learned, it was a lot of it from YouTube in the beginning. If I didn't yeah. know how to do something, I would look it up. And that's the thing, we are living in an age where you can use technology to your advantage or to destroy your life and just... Right, as a distraction. Yeah. Scroll your life away. Yeah. It's horrible. You can sit on any of those apps for hours, man. Just what designed to do. Yep, and watch just stupid video. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's horrendous. Um, as far as, I, you probably didn't deal with this right in a resume or anything like that. Uh, my resume is Life. my portfolio. Yeah, and your personality. It's, Exactly. You're Especially away. when you're when you're you know selling photography, they're not really hiring you know just anybody. Especially if you're doing it for a big wedding, people that are looking to capture those memories for years. They're looking at your work. They're looking at what you provide as a person. You gotta they're gonna be able to work with you. They like your personality, and that took years to you know step into those shoes and be comfortable and you know have the have the guts to you know go in for a job a big job like uh, when you're doing a ten thousand dollar wedding it's not you know just play you miss that moment you miss that shot 
it's a problem, you know. So you gotta be on your on your game, man. You gotta know what you're doing. You gotta be prepared for every mistake that can go wrong. Extra batteries, extra. Le you have to be. It's like preparing for war. You gotta have your gear ready, you know. I actually saw an article. Wouldn't go that far, but yeah, yeah. I feel you. I feel you on the whole analogy. Uh, photographer didn't show up to a wedding and they sued him. Yep. I don't know. I don't think just the, the probably. I don't think the charge. case is done yet. But. Yeah, and that's the backside of photography. Is a lot of the back work that a lot of people don't see is you know paperwork. You gotta have your contracts ready. You gotta like for big jobs that people are paying a ton of money for. You've got to have everything in order, what you're doing, when, how, you got to have the itinerary, it's, it's a lot of work, you know. Even with big businesses, if you're shooting a commercial for them or something like that, everything has to be written down, you got to be a script, there's got to be a storyboard, like a lot of work go on to the back end of the job. I did not know. Yeah. <laughs> I was unaware. I thought I just stood there and this dude took pictures of me. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I my we whole make life. it look Thank easy. You. Yeah. Quick media. Yeah. Look easy. Thank yeah. you. Quick Nick, media. Nick yeah. definitely makes it look really easy. <laughs> just like we are supposed to seem like we know everything. You know, client asks us a question, we're just supposed to know yeah. and make it look easy. I learned uh, something way back in the day when I actually I worked in car sales like when I was in my 20s, early 20s, and uh, whenever somebody asks you a question you don't know, even if you don't know, be like, let me, you know, give me a little bit, I'll find out for you. Yep. Never say I don't know. And that's the thing, at this day and age, you, you will find the answer. There is a YouTube, there is an article. You should be able something. to find a Google search before they're done finishing the question. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's, uh, it's easy. It's, nowadays, it's easy for anybody to actually get to do what they want. It's just you have the passion for it and the drive for it. Then the discipline to follow through. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a crucial factor that most of our society is missing. Is yeah, the discipline, discipline to follow through. Yeah, it's easy discipline touch. or you have like, you're so overwhelmed, you're just like, you know what? Screw it. And then you go for it. That I can't tell you how many of my friends have gotten good opportunities that way. It's like midnight, and they're like, you know what? I'm just going to apply. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> yeah. It's the best feeling in the world when right. you're like, but think about how many hundreds of thousands of people are working at a job they don't like, and then they come home, and they're stressed, and they're not giving what they need to their family, but they're also not applying anywhere. Yeah. They're not applying in life either. Right, they're not applying in life, they're not applying in indeed. They're just work surviving. People. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Well, it's hard, dude. You bury yourself in credit card debt and you get two kids on the way and then, you you know what I mean, you got a house payment. Yep. No wonder you go bald, you know what I mean? Like, for real. No it's wonder. not just going bald. This, that type of stress actually plays a big role in your... Yeah, it'll kill you. Uh, yep. It will... Strokes, it will, yeah. heart attacks. Yep. Those are the 50-year-olds that are dying of heart attacks and strokes. So no it's, doubt. Uh, it's a big part of living a good life. It's to find really what you're passionate about, what makes you happy, and you're helping people. What are your thoughts on Dave Ramsey? He's really good for people who have uh, impulse control. Yeah. Uh, generally, lower class, lower middle class, uh, because a lot of his, his advice is focused on psychology. Uh, like if you have a, two loans, a loan for a thousand dollars and a loan for ten thousand. Uh, his advice is not to pay off the one with the higher interest first. It's to pay off the smaller one first, hmm. because it feels good to have that loan gone, and it makes it more likely that you will stay on track, which isn't wrong. But as a financial advisor who has a hands-on approach with my clients. Let's do the smart approach. thing for your money, like that's gonna help you get on track more quickly, and I will help you stay on track. Not just hope that, you know, we're gonna meet once and you, you do what you're supposed to do. So yeah, it's, it's great for reaching, to, uh, reaching out to a huge amount of people and giving some good advice, but if you need something more specific, you want more help, reach out to an individual.
Like me, not him. No, I'm just yeah. I'm kidding. Wow, you set me up for that one. Oh, I had to, dude. You the totally gave me a sales started. pitch, dude. You gave me the best sales pitch on planet Earth, dude. No, or Ian or myself, whoever you feel more comfortable with. Um, You're both amazing at what you do. I see, I see how much people appreciate you, both of you and talk about you. He's a mentor of mine. He's uh, try. trying to learn everything I can from you. Um, yeah, the job search. Um, tips for creating a standout resume and cover letter. Um, for me, your experience is you have more than you think. You know, yep. you worked at a restaurant, or you know, or you worked uh, slicing sandwiches like I did, Jersey Mike's. You learned communication skills. You learned uh, sales skills. You learned uh, customer service skills. You learned uh, leadership skills, right? If you were a, right. a, a lead or something of that nature. Right, the way you can dress it up is by simply looking at it like very analytically. Like, what skills was I using? Like a LinkedIn. Yeah. You know how when you're filling out your skills on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. that's how you should look at every job that you used to do. It's been like, what skills did I use? Oh, leadership. Yeah. All of these things, and then throw them up there, and then punch it up, and you know, the years of experience thing I think is the biggest hindering block to a majority of people when it comes to hitting that apply button at midnight. Right, they're like, I don't have that experience. Which is why I need to get volunteering. Sure, but every financial advisory position I applied to when I was a kid, or when I was you know, in college, I had no thought that I had the experience for, but the college advisor that I went to speak to punched up my resume, they're like, yeah, you have five years of financial experience. You've been at LSU for four years, you know what I mean? And then you did this one thing in high school. So that's five years financial experience. And I don't know if it's right, but that's what they taught me, and that's what I did. And I sent my resume out. Maybe they didn't qualify as experience, maybe they did, but it doesn't matter. I got the job interview, right. or I didn't, and I still had the guts to apply. Yeah, I, mean, I was gonna say the exact same thing as you, which is the creativity. And, because like I worked at a subway in college. I Jersey that. Mike's better, yeah. but it's cool. Right. <laughs> the, the overnight shift. That's how you know what advisor you want. <laughs> Jersey Mike's or subway, you choose. But I was the only one there. Yeah. And so I just, I wasn't just a sandwich artist. I ran the I shop. I love how you added the artist part. That's good. That's good. That's Keep, going. <laughs> Keep going. Keep uh, going. I ran the place <laughs> yeah. every night. If there was a problem, I had to be the one to solve it. Count those quarters at the end of the night. That's an accounting skill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But, I mean, but yeah, I think so many people go to a job and they don't, they don't think anything except what's right on the surface. But thinking creative, creatively about your experience, I think, is a huge indicator of whether you're going to get a job or not. Because when you go in for an interview and they ask you, yeah, tell me about a time where you solved a, you know, a problem where there was another coworker, you know, uh, issue. It's like, oh, I just worked at Subway, so that didn't apply. Well, no, there's plenty of things that happen. The you hobo that you had to kick out, yeah, <laughs> 3 a.m. Yeah, get creative. There's ways to think about this. Right, but if you're, if you're not thinking that way, then you're not going to be able to talk that way in an interview. Yeah. And so preparing really comes down to actually paying attention in class, which, whoops, I think that's going downhill. Uh, people can't read anymore. People can't write anymore. So if you can't read, you can't think eloquently, which makes it very Is hard it to be down? creative. Yes. Well, I know a lot sure? of mi middle school teachers are saying their kids have first and second grade reading comprehension. That was COVID, right? Well, they're going to be slacked out, and a lot of the schools weren't prepared to go online. I, so I don't care learn what the years. excuse is. Sixth graders who have a first grade reading level is unacceptable. I believe there are <laughs> statistics that it's continuously going down. Oh, Lord. Yeah. It, yeah. It's partially parenting. It's partially... All of the tools that schools used to have to discipline children are gone. I knew I was dumber than grandma, but I didn't know it was on a national level. There, there's kids that don't show up to class, don't fill in any assignments, and then they're passed because the school will look bad if they don't. Right? It's, yeah, it's an easy, epidemic. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've got a yeah. big problem, which I think can be an opportunity for the people who do want to succeed because they might have less competition than they have no competition come 10 years from now besides AI. You know what I mean? As long as you're a human... I'm not too team. worried about that. <laughs> yeah, me and you have some differing opinions on that. There, uh, there was always something, right? Uh, you, 
you probably haven't experienced this yet, but about every 10 years for the last 50 years or so, there has been some new technology that people said was going to take away my job. What happened in 2010? Uh, before that, so robo-advisors, right, those have been uh, around, yeah. yeah, and it's like, oh, those are going to take, you know, those are going to become the new advisor. The worst advisors. Right, no. Yeah. Like, AI is going to be incredibly effective at doing certain things, but financial planning is not about building a portfolio. I'm not worried about taking my job. I'm more than happy letting the proven intelligent computer help me build my portfolios. But what it's never going to be able to do uh, better than me is help someone that I know figure out how they want to live their lives. And eventually, I think an AI could do an equal job to me. Uh, it eventually, because I have I have pretty high hopes for AI. But then it just it's they're another person, right? So if you like their personality, use them. If you don't, use me or a different AI, right? There's, it's just going to be another person. And yeah. so you you match up You might be an AI, actually. Now that I'm thinking about it already. <laughs> <laughs> might, well, might be Elon Musk's first edition out here. We might all be AI. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're just smart, This might dude. be a simulation. We might all just be living out these... And that's the end of the pod. We'll see you next week, <laughs> folks. Uh, I'm freaked out. No. <laughs> Uh, going back to resumes real quickly, uh, Moose, for our more non-traditional um, listeners, like I guess you and I, could you talk about building your portfolio like in, in lieu of having a resume and how important that is? So for you? photography, any creative you know, field, you kind of want to go, like for instance, I wanted to do some food product stuff, some restaurants. Gotcha. I can set up something at home get a loaf of bread from the store and create something. You're building the pictures that you want people to pay you for. Before, a lot of younger photographers, they just want to start making the money, but why are they going to pay you all that money? You got to show them what you're capable of. I took regular products. I took, you know, things that people want the type of pictures of. Even for have portraits. I would just take my niece to the park, have mm -hmm. fun, let her play, and take some nice pictures of her. And a lot of those pictures became my portfolio in the end. You know, it's a great picture that I have that means a lot to me for my niece, but at the same time I used it for my portfolio, cars that I would find. For me, I work on a lot of different types of photography from everything from businesses to children to babies to families, weddings. Uh, car events, all different type of things. I picked the stuff that I wanted to work on and build it that portfolio. So a lot of it, again, it's the work that you're going to put in, the discipline you're going to put in. You know, uh, for instance, you know, I had a, I had a gig for a jewelry uh, company and uh, that actually happened with a jewelry company and a towel company. And I didn't have any product like that. I just went out, grabbed a couple of towels, grabbed some jewelry from, I think it was Hobby Lobby or something, and just played around with it. Yeah. So that way I'm prepared. A lot of it is preparation. Going back to, you know, the resume, when I was 15, I worked at the office in my high school. I used that as part of my resume because I answered the phones. I uh, I worked on the fire plan for, you know, the school. Made all the papers that go into the uh, in all the classes. And so I used that all my resume that I did that. It shows them, you know, part of that you can take lead on something and work on something and have that drive to. Because a lot of companies, that's what they're looking for: somebody that have the drive, that's going to be working, that's going to be. A go-getter, you know. And back to the resume part, what puts you different from all the stuff, you know, from all the, the different resumes they go through. I was taught by my mom, extra languages is one of the biggest things people look for. You speak a little bit of Spanish, you do speak Spanish, you can communicate <laughs> a little bit. So. It was on my resume, yeah. but I'm going to keep You know, yeah. I'm sure mm -hmm. most people take one or two Spanish classes, you can the easy stuff, 
Yeah. So all that stuff helps, you know. Yeah, to translate it into like a more traditional aspect, I think that's like, for me, I didn't have a, a market necessarily, right, going into financial advising. So it's your resume for you, right, is your, your body of work. Yeah. And that's how you accumulate new clients. And as a financial advisor, it's your book of business, right? right? And it's your market. And so a resume, even at a 16-year-old level, is something that you're going to be building for the rest of your life. And it's your name. Right. And so it's your market. It's the people that you associate with. It's the people that, you know, eventually you'll end up doing business with. And you'll either take their Christmas picture or you'll advise their, you know, family with money. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, the resume thing is not a piece of paper necessarily. I don't think it's how it should be looked at. It should be looked at as like a, you know, continued thing that follows your name. And, you know, it's an embodiment of your work and your work ethic and who you are as a person to a certain extent. Yeah. Right. And I think it also it matters to ask the question, what is the person looking for who is going to review my resume? Oh, because definitely sell to your market. Right. You know, when I, mean, I was know your mind, mind, they didn't want financial advisor experience. Exactly. Because the job was specifically for recent college grads. So what did they want? They wanted, uh, in hindsight, I found, I realized this, they wanted people who were disciplined who they saw from the resume could do something hard and not give up. Yeah. And that's what a lot of jobs want, is to show that you can do something hard and not give up. And it has to look professional. With ChatGPT, there's no, no excuse. excuse. Whatever. Right. Look up, whatsoever. Ask ChatGPT or look it up online, uh, outline of a good resume, find one you Go like. Go Google Docs, brother. Right. There's a hundred exactly. of them. Exactly. Find one you like. Have ChatGPT help you fill it out. When you're writing a cover letter, my recommendation is write it based on the job application and then put it into ChatGPT. First, correct it, right? <laughs> Where, did I misspell anything? Or are there any sentences that don't make sense? And then help me make this sound a little bit better. Yeah. There's no excuse. If I'm looking at a resume and I see a bunch of typos, it's just going in the trash. 100%. Because if you, if you don't, you either don't care enough to put in the effort or you tried and that was your best effort. Either way, it's wrong. Yeah. 100%. Which leads to my final point, which is a lot of times the interviewer is not doing that full time. Like if I need to hire somebody, I'm the one interviewing, but I'm not an interviewer. So I have a list of questions that I have to ask based on what my company says I have to ask. I don't necessarily care about the answer to the question as much. I need to know that we are a good fit. So you as the interviewee being able to tell a story that makes me like you, that connects us, uh, yeah, that makes really you not sound like a robot. <laughs> That's what's most important, because I need to know we can work together. Yeah, you gotta be relatable no matter what field you're in. Yep. Period. If you're not relatable, then it's uh, relatable is not likable, and it's a hard boundary to like keep in line in your head, especially in the interview space. They're, they, I think a good interview would have a trick question in it, mm. like do. where they're gonna be like, oh yeah, so you know you like you know hurt people. Uh, it's super fun, isn't it? You know, not like that. Like that's an easy dump, yeah, yeah. but you know what I mean? So that you're not, you know, you have to show some sort of character. You have to show some sort of relatability. Like, no, that's what the hell, you know? And then, but that's a little too much Yeah. in the weeds detail. Well, I think to your point, yeah, you, they, they need to throw something at you to see how you work under pressure. Yeah. And you think like, I'm very good at not getting flustered and that's gotten me a lot of jobs in the past. I think I made you go red a few times. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I try my best, man. I try. I try to get them all rosy cheeked in public situations, but um, no, I can I can flat out embarrass myself. You know, pants fall down, whatever. It does not matter. To yeah, me. actually, you showed up at the Grinch as <laughs> a Christmas <laughs> party as dressed as the Grinch. That's something. Right, I would and then a Halloween do. party. I showed up as a 
as the, as the Grinch inside of an inflatable dinosaur costume yeah. and burst out of it. Oh, you weren't at that one. <laughs> <laughs> we missed that one. Was there that pictures? Was we need yeah. this. Yeah, I, I, it was Insert edited tested, picture. But I won the I won the costume contest. Oh, we're clipping it, in, dude. It's getting clipped for sure. You we'll see how important picture. pictures are. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Speaking of the devil. Speaking of yeah, that was a hot one. That's insane. That's awesome. No, I you, you're right. You can't get flustered in the interview, and you got to keep your head, and you got to keep your cool, and it's you know you got to know who you are as a person. I think yeah. ultimately is where that comes from. So so by the way, I would actually do this in real life. If if I was in an interview and someone asked me. Like describe a time where you had to to work under pressure, and get it right. I would bring up that Halloween costume story because it was really hard in the Grinch costume inside of that inflatable thing to take off the glove to try to unzip the thing and burst out of that at the right time. It, and I nailed it. So, can you work under pressure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hey, dude. I want that low pressure lifestyle he's got going on with and the who doesn't like you more after you tell that story. Come on. True. <laughs> True. Definitely. It's a beautiful example actually. You know, it shows relatability, it shows, you know, personality. Um, but have a backup that's work related in case they don't like it. Ooh, <laughs> for sure. I would definitely stay with work related, but, you know, in general. Um, that is work related for us, strangely enough. It, it was, yeah. That so, was networking. Yeah, for real. <laughs> That's Ian marketing his name. <laughs> you know Seriously, I mean? yeah. So, <laughs> Ian does it a little different than I do, but you know, Hakuna Matata. It's just a different phase. <laughs> yeah, teach their, yeah, for real. Once I get to that phase, I'll be bursting out of stranger costumes. <laughs> um, interview prep. How did y'all prep for interviews? Lots and lots of role play. And it's super embarrassing to ask someone you know to sit down and pretend to be the interviewer. And so, you know what most people do? They don't do it. Why do they do it in front of a mirror like a crazy person? I've heard the mirror. I thought that's where you were going. But no, you that, actually that's, person? that works. That's good. But it's even better to have someone else because it's actually embarrassing. Uh, and they might ask some questions, like tell, you should tell them spitball, right? Here's some questions, but also spitball. So you can see how you react in the moment. Yeah. And as long as you can take it seriously and not be a child, then it's a really good practice. And then what do you do after that? You get a different friend to do it again, because you don't want to be flustered. <laughs> hmm. It's very easy, just role play. Well, we learned how you stopped getting flustered, I guess. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, for this job, we spent six months uh, training, and a big part of that was role playing with each other. Yeah. Silly situations, serious situations, it worked very well. Yeah, all of our training had role play in it. It's, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, for me, I just researched the company. I knew more about the company than the person interviewing me when, by the time my interview came around. So then when they were like, do you have any questions about the company? I was like, yeah, actually, what was the discrepancy here between your mom and her? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I was ready. You know, and I had a strong, concrete understanding of the company I was applying to, the position I was applying to, and why I was applying to it. Yeah, that's important too. And, uh, you know, I knew what I was doing there and what my intentions were. My intentions were to get that job and to, you know, make an impact. Yep. And so, I think, you know, that's that's how I prepped. I didn't do it in a crazy talk in the mirror, talking to a friend, which would have been helpful, which would have been great. Obviously, talk to Dad a little bit and talk to Big Mike, you know, a little bit, but it's... Uh, it wasn't necessarily like role play. I was definitely, and still am, a little bit of a child. So it's, that's that's tough for me to be like, hey, let me have you, you know, this person that, I don't know, I have very personal relationships with each and every one, you in this room and everybody outside of this room too, right? So to be like, hey, can you pretend to do this and be this other person? For me, it was always far too difficult because then I'm like trying to like pretend there's someone else in my head too. So it was... It's far too difficult for my small brain to be able to comprehend. How unfortunate is that comfortable man over there because he's never been offered the chance to sh prove his worth? What are you talking about? It's a quote. Oh. Basically, oh. if you've never, if you've never 
put yourself into a situation that makes you uncomfortable, you're not growing. Oh, I'm uncomfortable all the time. That's not yeah. what I'm trying to say. I know you Th are. Those, yeah, those, you're, you're growing in a lot of directions. Yeah, those but interviews were... You should lean into the... Definitely. Discomfort. Definitely. 100%. That was one of the best pieces of advice <coughs> I ever got from a, a senior advisor, which is get uncomfortable. Yep. And it's like the, the networking, the cold calling, the everything. It's, I'm uncomfortable doing it. <laughs> right? And it's oh, even, yeah. you know, showing up in a suit to the annual breakfast and shaking hands with the mayor. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable doing, you know what I mean? Volunteering, it's it's not something I'm, you know, been accustomed to my whole life like you, but it's something I'm trying to get comfortable with. And yeah, uncomfortable, for sure, always. I'm uncomfortable you right now, we're doing a freaking podcast. I think I'm sweating. Grow, I think you have to, to be uncomfortable, man. That's so, part of life. 100%, you gotta get uncomfortable. Growing, growing pains, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a part of life, but, um, say that quote again. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, right, but the right gist is that the person who is who lived who has always lived in comfort uh, is is somehow um, oh what's the word miserable? No, not miserable. They're like a second class citizen because they never fully succeeded because they've today. never been given the chance to prove themselves. You can't evolve if you're never put into a situation where you need to. 100%. I get what you're saying. You're not going to find your potential if right. you're not challenged. Which again Always is the problem with the, how we're raising children nowadays, how we're educating them. They're not being challenged ever on anything. Not all of them, but a large majority of them. And so then they get to the real world and they get a job and they get fired on the first day. Life is hard. They show up to our good advice too. <laughs> That's also additional good advice if you need it. That is hard. Yeah. But it's just it makes me sick. These soft people that just have no comprehension of how cruel the world is, and then they, you know, they're protesting something on a college campus that their parents are paying for them to be attending, <laughs> and they don't even know what they're protesting. And it's like, then my sister can't have her graduation. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, no, 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 no. That was the worst part of school for me. The graduation. It's so boring. The graduation ceremony. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't go to my big one either. I but it was like, have so many of those to go to this. <laughs> it's not even funny. <laughs> okay. Oh, no blast! Can we get a time check? Uh, we have thirteen minutes left. You know, I think we did good enough this week. Uh, my uh, fellow uh, listeners, it's mostly me, anyways, listening we to this podcast. We didn't talk about why our fourth is missing. <laughs> oh, our fourth is missing. Bridmore is missing because. Why? I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know <laughs> yeah, I didn't know why either. That's why I didn't bring it up. Brimmore will be back next next month, yeah, hopefully. I'm sure people are wondering where is he. So. Oh, yeah, the, the 33 other people watching this podcast. Uh, go ahead and put it in the comments uh, where you think Brimmore is. And uh, if, yes. if uh, you get it right, we'll go ahead and ship you a, a Edward Jones coaster. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a professional tip for you then. Uh, if you can't do something, you just have to say, I can't do that today. Sorry guys, I can't show up. People get so in their heads about making up some elaborate excuse, what people are going to think. Just say you can't do it. Yeah. That's all that's needed. 100%. And if they respect you, the respect, I can't do it. Exactly. So, um, Cause I what's going to happen is that you give them an objection, then they think you want to do it. But there's this thing in the way, so they try to solve the problem. And it's like, oh, I just lied about that, and I could come up with another lie. Just oh, tell yeah. the truth and stop living in the web of lies. Yeah, I'm, do, I'm too dumb to lie. You should be too dumb to lie. Uh, That's a good trait. Mom always said, F doing what you, you love, do what you're good at, and you'll love it anyways. And life is hard, and then you'll die. Those are my three pieces of advice for the upcoming month of June. Get after it, kiddos. Any pieces of advice? Uh, keep working hard. Don't, you know. Yeah, you're going to die soon. Keep going. <laughs> uh, hey, again, a lot of people tell themselves I can't, but people will say I can and people that say I can't are both usually right. It depends on exactly. the mindset. A lot of it. It's, it's mindset. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think I didn't notice that Rocky quote. <laughs> I'm big on Rocky Arnold. I have Arnold's six rules of life, you know. 
up on my wall in mm. my room. You know, one of the things that you were talking about is to break some rules. Sometimes you have to break some rules to get where you want to be, you know. I'm not talking about any bad things. But Don't break rules. Yeah. We'll catch you next <laughs> month, folks. Thank you.